this is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hey, this is Jason Crowell from Norton Neuroscience Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. Thanks for listening to today's Neurology Podcast. Today, we have Carlos Gotch rejoining us. Carlos is a neurologist at the Hospital Clinic of Barcelona, and we last had him join us on this podcast back in October of 2021. Jeff Ratliff interviewed him about movement disorders associated with anti iglon 5 disease. Carlos, thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Jason. So today we are talking more about anti-Iglon-5 disease. So you and co-authors have a paper that's published March 26th in the journal Neurology. The title of this paper is Development of a Composite Score for the Clinical Assessment of Anti-Iglon-5 Disease. So Carlos, let's start with some background. This is a rare disease. Ted Burns, who many of our listeners will know, uh, used to talk about illness scripts for neurological diseases. So what's the illness script for the disease? How does it present and, and what signs and symptoms are you looking for? How would you describe the illness script for anti-Iglon-5 disease? The Iglon-5 disease is a rare disease, but uh, likely it's an undiagnosed uh, condition. So it's important to, to identify. Patients usually present uh, or consult to the neurologist, three reasons. The main one is for gait difficulties or movement disorders, such as chorea or craniofacial dyskinesias, as we already reported in our paper published in Neurology two years ago. Also, two other important presenting symptoms, sleep problems, abnormal behaviors during sleep associated with sleep breathing difficulties, and a third one, uh, an important also, is uh, dysphagia. Then, a small subset of patients can present because of cognitive problems, but that will be the, the major complaints leading to the neurologist. Then, when we see these patients, we found that they have uh, several neurological problems. No? For example, uh, sleep problems, mainly a parasomnia, and a sleep breathing uh, difficulty with apneas and stridor are present in up to 80-90% of the patients. Symptoms of bulbar dysfunction, dysphagia, dysartria, uh, in some and less frequently patients, episodes of respiratory difficulties can be present in also 80% of the patients in different degrees of, of severity. These symptoms for example, dysphagia can be mild in some patients or can be severe in others. No? Then 70% of the patients present gait difficulties, mainly gait instability. Again, the severity is quite variable. Some patients' gait instability is severe and the patient is unable to, to walk. In other patients, uh, there is uh, only a disequilibrium, some mild unsteadiness. No? And then also 70% of the patients have movement disorders, chorea, craniofacial dyskinesias, and then less frequently patients can present, for example, cognitive uh, complaints, 40% of the patients. But the combination of all these symptoms is which leads to suspect the, the disease, not that can present in several different phenotypes depending on the intensity of the disease. You know, if, uh, for example, some patient present with sleep problems, maybe someone can suspect a REM sleep behavior uh, disorder or a patient that presents with uh, chorea and have cognitive problems. Often, Huntington disease is suspected. In other patients with dysphagia, maybe a myasthenia gravis or even a motor neuron disease can be suspected because in 15% of the patients, fasciculations uh, can be seen. So we can think that the disease, in this sense, in, in, the, in its clinical presentation, it's quite heterogeneous, 
But at the end, there are some subset of symptoms that combine together and lead to several different phenotypes of the disease, as of course in many other uh, neurological diseases, no? such as Lewy body diseases, Parkinson uh, disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, also progressive supranuclear palsy can have different presentations, but the core symptoms are always there. And I will say that for anti iron 5 disease, the, the core symptoms will be sleep problems, gait instability, dysphagia, symptoms of bulbar dysfunction and movement disorders. Usually you will find in the patient these four problems combined. The pathophysiology associated with this. So the name anti iglon 5 I would conclude that these individuals have antibodies against iglon 5 What else can you tell us about it? What is iglon 5 That's probably a good place to start. <laughs> a major problem is that we don't know exactly which is the function of iglon 5 as a protein in the surface of the neuron. That's uh, unclear and, and that it's a point that makes difficult to understand uh, which is the the pathophysiology of, of the disease. It's a disease that in a close road, no, or in an interplay between uh, autoimmunity and neurodegeneration. No? There were many, many features of the disease that points to, to neurodegeneration. No? Uh, the disease usually has a, a chronic, insidious, slowly progressive uh, presentation. Important to say that up to 20-25% of the patients can have a subacute uh, presentation in few weeks or months. But most patients have very slowly progressive disease. No, that in addition that the patients are are older, are aged in the 60s, 70s, or even older, and also to the fact that in most of them there is not a good response to immunotherapy points to neurodegeneration. No? And then also important that in the first neuropathological examinations we found in the, in the brain of these patients a, a neuronal thalopathy involving the hypothalamus and the brainstem of uh, yeah, the tegmentum of the brainstem. But uh, nowadays, no, it has been past almost 10 years after the initial description of the disease. We think that likely the disease is, is autoimmune. Autoimmunity goes first and then later can come a neurodegeneration. And there are several evidences pointing to a primary role of autoimmunity. First, there is a neuronal autoantibody that is directed against a protein in the neuronal surface of, of the neuron. Then, important, uh, the disease is associated with a specific HLA haplotype. Then, in vitro, the antibody seems to have a pathological effect in neurons. No, It induces uh, an internalization an irreversible internalization of the iglon 5 protein, and there are evidence that can, this can lead uh, to a neurodegenerative or, or, an, or abnormalities in the cytoskeleton of these neurons in vitro. And most important, tauopathy is not universal. No? There are uh, brains of patients with anti iglon 5 disease that has been examined and there is no uh, neuronal uh, tauopathy. Even there are some mild inflammatory infiltrates in the tegmentum of, of the brainstem. And all of this supports to a primary autoimmune uh, process that could lead secondary to a neurodegeneration, to a tauopathy. But a definitive uh, proof that the disease is autoimmune will be to reproduce the disease in an animal model. No? And at present, this has not been shown clearly. Given the thought that this is autoimmune, what's the response to immunosuppression or immunomodulatory treatment? There is not a good response to immunotherapy in most patients. In different areas, the range of improvement with the immunotherapy, either uh, intravenous uh, steroids, immunoglobulins, duximab, uh, plasma exchange, uh, 
the range of response is uh, between 10 to 40 percent of the patients and it's also important to say that this improvement in many of them is not spectacular the improvement is usually uh, partial only some symptoms improve the, the improvement is not com complete the, the symptoms are still there but milder and also important this improvement is often transient no the, there is a, often a relapse and to repeat the immunotherapy can be necessary in these patients. Despite of that, we think that uh, a trial of immunotherapy can be helpful in these patients, at least in some of them, and it's worth uh, to try, particularly if the disease has a short duration. No? Uh, I think that there is some evidence that patients that are treated early uh, the, the rate of improvement is higher than those that are treated several years later after the onset of the disease. Very good. And so in this paper, you describe disease composite score made up of multiple domains. Can you tell us a little bit about the rationale behind developing this composite score and then the score itself? The aim of developing this score was exactly what we were discussing, you know, that the response to immunotherapy in many patients is unclear. And in this sense, uh, we feel that uh, we needed a tool, a scale, to, to assess better the symptoms of the disease, its severity, and then that this uh, scale, this, this tool, could be useful to assess the response of the immunotherapy or also to evaluate the progression of the disease. No? In this sense, uh, one important question that is still unclear, I think that how the disease presents at the onset, we know many things, but one unclear point is which is the natural course of, of the disease. We know that the mortality is high, that 20-40% uh, uh, of the patients are dead three to five years later uh, the diagnosis. No? Most common case of uh, death are, are sudden death no? or, uh, or also pues, uh, aspiration pneumonia related to, to dysphagia or, or respiratory failure. But uh, in this sense, developing a, a tool that could be useful to assess the benefit of immunotherapy and also the course of the disease uh, was which led us to, to develop it. The scale is divided in, in, five, uh, in five domains that cover uh, different subtype of symptoms. The first one is related to, to bulbar symptoms. There is a second domain that focus on sleep problems. Third one is focus on gait and movement disorders. There is a fourth related to cognition and neuropsychiatric symptoms, psychosis, delirium. And then the last one, the fifth, is related to other symptoms that can occur in anti iglone 5 disease, mainly dysautonomia, fasciculations, and also oculomotor abnormalities. That makes a lot of sense, and it's it's easy to see the potential clinical utility to to understand responsiveness to treatment. One question I have is, I understand there's this autoimmune component. Has there been any evidence that there's a perineoplastic component? Have any of these patients had had concurrent cancers, and there's thought to be some kind of perineoplastic aspect to this? No, the rate of cancer tumors is not higher than you could expect from a population aged at 50 or, or older. No? The rate of, uh, of cancer tumors in our area is just 10% and not any specific type of cancer or tumor. The same applies for other autoimmune diseases. I see patients with movement disorders and you know I see patients who come in with gait and postural instability and they have uh sometimes have bulbar symptoms and and if i'm thinking that well this doesn't doesn't look like they quite have typical parkinson's and i'm thinking about an atypical parkinsonian syndrome and 
and then I, I think, well, maybe this fits, you know, maybe this is more consistent with a tauopathy like PSP. And then, you know, the fact that, that some of these patients you're describing, they have some of these symptoms and they go on to have pathology associated with tau. It's tough for me to reconcile. Does that make sense? Some patients are uh, with anti iglon 5 disease are misdiagnosed with PSP. But uh, maybe uh, some uh, key points uh, or some red flags to suspect anti 5 disease in this type of patients are the presence of, of atypical futures. For example, in a patient with a PSP, you wouldn't expect a prominent sleep disorder with abnormal sleep behaviors or sleep breathing difficulties. Also, a stridor will make you consider a multiple system atrophy. Also, for example, the presence of chorea in a patient whose other clinical picture resembles those of PSP make you suspect uh, anti iglon 5 disease or also the presence of uh, dysautonomia. Patients with anti iglon 5 disease sometimes present with uh, urinary dysfunction and also episodes of intense perspiration. So this could be uh, red flags that will suggest anti iglon 5 disease. The other point that it's easy is that the diagnosis of the disease is made by a blood test. You can check if there is the antibody in serum, that in serum is present in 100% of the patients. And if the antibody is there, you have the diagnosis. No, I think that the problem of most uh, movement disorders related to neurodegenerative conditions such as Parkinson disease, multiple system atrophy, PSP, is the lack of uh, confirmatory tests that you can perform a blood analysis and say, oh, I suppose, and, and I am optimistic that in the next years we will have this test. But uh, at present, anti iglon 5 disease uh, has this point that makes easy its diagnosis. No, you only have to suspect. Very good, Carlos. Thanks for joining us today and covering all this. This is really helpful information. Again, I want to say the title of this article, it's Development of a Composite Score for the Clinical Assessment of Anti-Iglon 5 Disease. It was published March 26th in Neurology. And again, I've been speaking with Carlos Gotch. Carlos, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.